school zone. They'd be dismissed right out this door to my right. Fifth grade and under parents, if you want them to go to Children's Church. And you may want them to go this morning because we're talking about sex. And uh, so you may have an added motivation if you don't want them to hear that conversation. You know, the reason we're talking about sex this morning is because the Bible talks about it. It's the only reason we're talking about it. I'd rather not talk about it, honestly. But the reason we talk about it is the Bible. You know, one of the things that uh, sets us apart as a church from some local congregations is we really do believe that the Bible should be the final authority for what we believe and what we practice. Uh, I'm not the final authority as the preacher or the pastor. There's not any other book that we look to to be the final authority of what we believe in practice, but we, but we look to the Bible. And the Bible can really, if you'll follow the words of God in the Bible, the Bible can really save you from a lot of um, unbelievable problems in your soul and in your life. Now, I know there's certain things that you can't learn except by experience. We, we've got a number of of widows in our church. I think, how many new widows do we have in the last 12 months? At least three. We may have more. And we have lots of widows uh, in our congregation. And, you know, until I became a widower, I really couldn't relate to a widow. I really couldn't identify with them. I had to learn through my experience, which I wouldn't wish on anyone, what that means, what that feels like, in, in order to identify. Well, Certainly, there's a lot of things in life that are that way. We only can learn by our experience. But I want you to understand when it comes to uh, moral instruction, you don't have to wait uh, to fail and learn by your experience in order to develop the right belief and the right practice about something. And that's what I'd like to see for all of our young people that are here today, that you will not have to experience sexual immorality in order to find out, hey, that's not all it's trumped up to be, Uh, that you need to turn from that, that you need to uh, walk in a different way, then practice that in your life. And uh, certainly if you've already fallen into sexual immorality, then uh, Jesus wants to redeem you. He's a God of redemption, and he wants to redeem you from that sin and every other sin uh, that you could possibly fall into in your life. And so this morning we're continuing a, a, a series that we began a number of weeks ago on what would Paul write to the church in Oklahoma City if he was writing a letter to the church of Oklahoma City. And we're in, the, in a section uh, of the series called Admonitions. You know, these are instructions that he gave to churches previously that I believe if he was writing to the church in Oklahoma City, he would include these texts. Uh, And he would say these things because we're dealing with the same problems as uh, in the church in Oklahoma City that he was dealing with uh, over 2,000 years ago when he was writing these letters to the churches. And so we've settled in and we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 this morning. And we're going to look at verses 9 through 20. And we started last week in verses 9 and 10. Now Paul was writing this letter to the church at Corinth, it was, it was, a, a, uh, uh, it was a, a number of small groups. It wasn't a congregation like this. It was a number of small groups that were meeting in homes, and the Lord had blessed the city of Corinth. Uh, the Spirit had moved on many people's lives, and many had been saved and baptized. And those folks were now meeting in homes in small groups, And so he was writing a letter to them, and that letter would be passed around among all of those different groups, and they would read it. And that and that those letters were addressing problems that people were having in the church. And so he was giving real uh, instruction to the church about problems and how to fix them, how to deal with them. And so this is one of the things that he wrote about in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, there was a lot of disciples in the church at Corinth that weren't acting like disciples, and it was questionable whether they were disciples at all. Uh, in fact, some of the problems that they were dealing with in Corinth was one brother was committing fornication with his stepmother. 
And Paul said that's something that even the pagan Gentiles don't practice. And that's going on in the church. Another brother was cheating his brother in a business transaction. And uh, that brother was turning around and suing him for cheating him, for defrauding him in that business transaction. Some brothers were committing fornication with prostitutes. I'm just letting that one sink in. You know, what if we had a bunch of brothers here committing fornication with prostitutes? You know, typically sexual sins in the church are practiced secretly. And we see each other on Sunday morning and you know, how you doing? Fine. How you doing? Fine. And, uh, and then if there's someone that's, that's committing sexual immorality, we don't know about it, you know? And so, uh, well, these were public acts of uh, fornication that were going on that the people knew about. And so you actually had some brothers that were committing fornication with prostitutes in the worship of pagan idols there in the church. So in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 20, Paul's addressing this problem. And he mentions sexual immorality or some form of it seven different times in these 11 verses. In fact, this is, uh, bar none, it is the longest discourse and the most thorough treatment of this subject in the entire New Testament. So he was serious about this, about addressing this problem and about providing uh, guidance for the church in dealing with this problem. He told them in verse 18 of chapter 6, he told them, flee. Flee sexual immorality. Uh, fleeing sexual immorality is actually the theme of this particular truth talk that Paul was giving to the church. Flee. I mean, that's a pretty uh, simple solution. Uh, to flee means to run away. Okay? It's like, okay, I need to get away from this. And I need to run away from this. That's what it means to flee. It means to escape. It means to shun. And then around that particular admonition to flee, Paul builds his case. And he tells them why they should flee. Last week we saw Paul began his truth talk with this statement. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be, be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And we looked at that last week and we spent most of our time on that last week. And what we came to understand is that Paul did not want the church to be deceived by the false idea that someone in the church engaging in sexual immorality was eternally secure. And so he, was, he was said, don't be deceived about this. <laughs> these, these folks, these kind of folks, and he was characterizing people by a practice in their life, they will not, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. You know, that's important for us to know. Uh, and it's, it's important for us to consider. And we reasoned through that last week. And then he, he reasons with them, even though uh, some of them uh, at one time could be characterized and defined by these different sins he says to them, Jesus cleared your record, and he redefined who you were and who you are. In 1 Corinthians 6, 11, he says, and such were some of you, past tense. You were this way, but it's not who you are anymore is what he's saying. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And in this verse is the first reason that Paul says to flee. And the reason is this, sexual immorality subjects you to your old identity. That's what he said in those verses. Sexual immorality subjects you to your old identity. It's not who you are. Uh, if you practice sexual immorality as a disciple of Jesus, it's acting like who you were rather than acting like who you are. And this creates a lot of confusion <laughs> in your own soul. 
if you're being double-minded about who you are. You know, we looked at this last week, and I'm not going to spend any more time on it, but as far as I'm concerned, Paul could have just ended the discourse on fleeing sexual immorality with that statement by just saying, hey, flee, this is not who you are. I mean, there's tremendous power in knowing that you're not a fornicator. You were a fornicator, but you're not a fornicator. There's tremendous power in knowing that before Jesus, you were an adulterer, but now you're not an adulterer because of Jesus, not because of your great works that you've done, but because of Jesus, your identity has been redefined and it's not who you are anymore. And so there's tremendous power in that, that we need to tap into each one of us by faith in Jesus Christ. We need to learn how to deal with temptation by saying, you know what? You know, if I'm tempted to steal, that means I would be a thief. Well, I'm not a thief, so I'm not going to steal. If I'm tempted to fornication or adultery, uh, when I'm tempted, you know, I could say, you know what? That's who I was, but that's not who I am. And so I'm not going to do that. I mean, there's tremendous power in learning to draw lines around your understanding of your identity in Jesus Christ. And so I could say, you know, that would have been enough. He would have just stopped right there. That would have been fine. But he doesn't stop. He doesn't stop. And so I want you to know that I'm not continuing because I want to continue. <laughs> I, I'm going to continue because Paul didn't stop with those admonitions. He continued to address this. And this comes back to uh, the Bible being the authority, not some teacher that stands before you and, and says, you know, we're going to stop right there. You see, that's not my right to do. I, it's not my right to redefine and reinterpret the Bible to get it to fit my theological system. And if you're listening to a teacher like that, here's what I would say. Flee. Get away from them. You know, let the word of God be your authority. And so Paul Paul continues here, this discourse, and he gets real philosophical. He adds these reasons that you should flee, church, sexual immorality. And so let's look at what he says with these particular reasons. The second reason that he gives is that sexual immorality subjects you to the power of the law of sin. Look what he says in verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of, of any. You know, David said in Psalm 51, uh, 51, 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. You see, all of us are born into sin. This means, simply means that when we are born, we are slaves to the law of sin. Within our members, within our physical members, there is a principle called sin. There is a law called sin. We inherited it as a result of the fall of the first man and the first woman. And when we are born, we are subject to that law. And I don't think anyone here would argue that if you're in your right mind. Uh, you began to uh, be subject to that law and your behavior and your actions before you're even conscious that you're doing it. And so we're born into iniquity. In Romans 7 and verse 21, Paul said, I find then a law, the law of sin, that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity or slavery to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? If you've never acknowledged it or not, I want you to know you're born a slave. All of us are born slaves to the law of sin. And that's why Paul says, oh, wretched man that I am. I mean, who wants to be a slave to the law of sin? I mean, I'm a slave to the law of gravity. What's this? And I really don't mind being a slave to the law of gravity. It really has some benefits. You know, it's really profitable. If I wasn't a slave to the law of gravity, then I would just float off in front of you. You know, right here this morning when I jumped, I wouldn't come down. 
And so I, I'm glad I'm a slave to the law of gravity. But I, I tell you what, it's a wretched thing being a slave to the law of sin. Wanting to do the right thing and then always finding yourself, Paul said, doing the wrong thing. Because you're a slave to the law of sin. I mean, it's a terrible place to be. A wretch, as the Lord Paul used. Ma, oh, I don't want to be that condition. A slave to the law of sin. You know, the law of sin within, within all men has incredible power, and we underestimate it. We think that we can play with sin and win. <laughs> you are fooling yourself. I mean, when you choose sin, you are going deeper into slavery to sin every time. And so it has incredible power, and it makes men slaves. All of us here in our society, we're all too familiar to addiction. And, and what it does to people. I mean, what I read was, what, 60,000 people died from overdose in 2016. You know, and the numbers of people that are killed by drunk drivers, and, and then the damage that's being done to people's physical health through addiction to various substances, it's incredible. And so we all understand the power of addiction, and especially you understand it, if you've been a slave to addiction, you understand it. Well, we're all born slaves to sin. And the, the law of sin within our members makes the most powerful man its slave. We look in the Bible at these powerful men like Samson. He was a slave to sin. He was a slave to his own lust. He was an immoral dude. As strong as he was. He was an immoral dude. And we see this all throughout the Bible. And then we see it in our society. You know, when's the latest scandal? What's, what's it going to be? You know, which person are we going to hear about? Powerful people that are slaves to the law of sin. Well, here's the good news of the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ emancipates slaves from the power of the law of sin. That's great news. That law of sin is in my members. It still is to this day. And it will be with me until I die and I get my new glorified body. But I want you to know Jesus Christ has emancipated me. He, he set me free from, the, from slavery to that law. I don't have to be in submission to it because of the power of Jesus Christ. So Paul wrote this in Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So Jesus, through Jesus, you can be emancipated from the power of the law of sin. You can be set free through the power of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus creates a new covenant between God and man. You know, what's the word covenant mean? It means an agreement. You had the old covenant based upon the law of Moses with the people, the Jewish people, in which in order for them to inherit the promises of God, they had to obey all of these rules and regulations that God gave to Moses. It's called the old covenant. You can read it in the Old Testament. But when Jesus Christ came, there, there was the establishment of a new covenant. And in that new agreement, righteousness is a gift that cannot be earned. You can't earn it by good works. You can't become righteous by performing good works. Instead, it's a gift in this new agreement, in this new covenant, that cannot be earned. Here's the way Paul said it in Romans chapter 3, 21. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. In other words, they predicted there was going to be this new agreement, and you could receive the gift of righteousness that would make you pleasing to God, apart from the law. They predicted it. And now it was fulfilled, Paul said, in Jesus Christ. He said, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and all who believe. What a tremendous blessing. I mean, I don't have to perform in order to become righteous. No, I receive righteousness that makes me acceptable to God by faith in Jesus Christ. What an incredible blessing that is. What that means for me is that all things are lawful for me. 
In other words, I don't have to fear the eternal judgment of God for anything related to my behavior. Now, I'm not saying that I won't be judged by men, but you know what? If I wanted to take a gun and, and kill somebody, you know what? I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. All things are lawful for me because my righteousness is a gift. I don't have to earn it, you know? If I wanted to go out and, and live like a whoremonger and uh, practice sin, I want you to know my righteousness is a gift of God. All things, all things are lawful for me now that I'm in Christ Jesus. I want you to know that is a tremendous blessing to know that and that I'm not going to be judged and you're not going to be judged based upon your performance. Righteousness is a gift. Don't water it down. I mean, it is a gift, period. So all things are lawful. But here's the thing. All things are not profitable, Paul said in this verse. All things are not helpful. You see, it's if you choose to commit sexual immorality, what Paul was saying, you, you may be free from divine du judgment, but that freedom from divine judgment will not prevent you from returning to your former life as a slave to the law of sin. Now, who would want to re-enter into slavery once you've been set free? But Paul is saying here, look, that's what's going to happen. He says that again over in Romans chapter 6. He said, you are slaves to the one that you obey. And whether you want it to happen or not, you're going to become a slave again to the law of sin if by design you choose to enter into sexual immorality. Sexual immorality subjects you to the power of the law of sin. And my experience has been that in the church of Jesus Christ today, uh, so many people are spending a lot of time trying to help disciples of Jesus find freedom again from that particular sin. A third reason that Paul gives to flee sexual immorality is he says sexual immorality subjects you to perverted appetites. Listen to verse 13. Food's for the stomach and the stomach's for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. See, it, uh, an appetite for food is normal. Who would agree with that? Say amen. Well, yeah, yeah, I and mean, we're all ready for lunch today, right? Amen. It says, now the body, though, look, he, he makes a transition. The body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. So God created you with a natural appetite for food. He did not create in you an appetite for perversion, sexual perversion. That did not come from the Lord is what Paul is saying. And sexual immorality, the moment you step over, sexual immorality in any form subjects you to an appetite for perversion. And the problem with that. It has many problems, but one of the main problems of that is that that appetite for sexual perversion can't be satisfied. And so once you step over that line and you develop an appetite for sexual perversion, it's going to lead to further sexual perversion in your soul and in your life. None of these perverted appetites, Paul said, will be in your resurrected body as disciples of Jesus. Praise God for that. Aren't you glad for that? You know? And that, that's just awesome. We're going to get a new glorified body and it's not going to have any perverted appetites in it. How about that? So, make your body your slave and live now in anticipation of what you will be. In other words, if I'm not going to have any perverted appetites then, I need to live like it right now. Because that really defines who I really am now that I'm in Christ Jesus. The fourth reason that he gives to flee sexual immorality is that sexual immorality subjects the body of Jesus to an unholy union. Look what he said in verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. You know, if you receive Jesus as your personal Savior, you are a member of what the Bible calls a spiritual body of Jesus Christ on the earth. And we're all connected. We're all a part of that spiritual body, those of us that have received Jesus. The church is called the body of Jesus. And the body has many members, according to what Paul said. And whatever you do that leaves a serious impression on you 
as a member affects other members of the body. You get it? Whatever you do that leaves a serious impression on you as a member affects other members of the body. Now, this idea is really difficult to accept. If your experience with church in the body and the body of Jesus is limited to a once a week encounter with a church in a worship service. I mean, anybody can fake it on Sunday mornings. Anybody. And, and you can go out and practice sexual immorality, show up for service, say, oh, praise the Lord, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great too. I know that from personal experience because I've done it. I faked it. And I've been with people that are faking it, you know, when it comes to their moral life and their moral condition. And so we can do that if that's really the only experience that we have of church. In the New Testament church, when you attended a meeting, you were an active participant. You know, at this meeting today, uh, right now, I'm the only one that's exercising my gift. And so let's just say I'm the mouth in the body of Christ right now, okay? And so, well, what about your gifts? How are they going to be exercised to edify the other members? Well, I, it was not going to happen here. That's why we have small groups. It's so that the gifts of the Spirit can flow through the different members of the group and we can practice team discipleship rather than discipleship by one gift, my gift. Okay? So, if you are actively participating with other members in a small group and not just attending once on Sunday morning, you can understand how your involvement in sexual immorality would affect all the other members. Because I want you to know, when you go, you're not going to be very participatory. <laughs> if you go at all, you know, you're going to feel guilt, you're going to feel shame, you're going to be amongst that group, and if it's a really... Uh, a group that's real transparent, people are going to ask you how you're doing and just that fine answer is not going to work. I mean, they may ask you more specific questions as you're transparent about your own struggles. And so all of a sudden, when you change your understanding and paradigm of what the church should really be, you can see why Paul would say this. That when you sin, when you enter into sexual immorality, and you join yourself in an unholy union, it impacts the other members of the body of Jesus. We come to understand why he would say that a little leaven, it leavens a whole lump, you know? Well, that's not going to happen on Sunday mornings, but I guarantee you, if we are engaged in the, in the body of Christ the way Jesus wants us to be engaged, you'll get it. You'll understand it. You know, it's like a man who's married who's committing adultery and he comes home to his wife. Don't you think that impacts her even if she doesn't know what's happening? Absolutely. It affects his desires for her. It affects his thoughts about her. It affects the way he relates to her. And the same thing happens in the, in the body of Jesus when we're really functioning the way that we're supposed to, to function. It was ludicrous to think that you could be spending time with a local temple prostitute and would not affect how you would relate to God or how you would relate to your brothers and sisters in Christ when you met with them in one of their meetings. So your immorality affects the other members of the body of Christ. It impacts them. You're not, you're not going to help them a lot. If you're failing yourself and, uh, and you're hiding it from the other members, you really can't hide it. Because you won't function the right way. And then the fifth reason that he gives for fleeing sexual immorality is that sexual immorality subjects you to an unholy union. Not only subjects the body of Jesus to an unholy union, but it, it subjects you to an unholy union. He says, or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Now, sex was created by God, and it was a good thing, and it was created to be a sacred physical union in marriage between one man and one woman for life. That was God's original design for marriage and also what sex was created for. As sacred means to be set apart. You know, this sacred physical union that the Bible calls being one flesh. It was the only act of marriage that God said could not be shared with another. 
Hey, I can share my money with others besides Sandra. I can share my time with others besides Sandra. I can share my material possessions with others besides Sandra. But when it comes to the act of marriage, I want you to know there's one person in the world and one person only that has a right to that, and that's her. And so that's what it means for sex to be sacred. It's set apart. It's for one person and one person only. Now, God knew what he was doing. When you limit that to one person and one person only, he, he knew what he was doing. This one flesh act in marriage, it has an incredible impression on you. It has an incredible impression on your desires. It has an incredible impression on your emotions, your mind. It has an incredible impression on your conscience. And I want you to understand something about this, this one flesh act. It, has, it leaves a greater impression on you than any other human activity. Any. Okay? Now, there's lots of things that can happen to you that can leave an impression on your soul that you can relive over and over and over again. If you've ever experienced great tragedy in your life, you can relive that great tragedy in your soul over and over again the, the rest of your life. Well, I want you to understand, with this one flesh union that God created to be sacred in marriage, if you commit sexual immorality, you will relive that experience the rest of your life. That's how powerful this experience is that God created for marriage alone. Now, this union and the impression it leaves is very healthy when you're married, <laughs> but only when you're married. It promotes, it promotes all kinds of great things in marriage. I want you to know it promotes romance in marriage. I mean, and that's a good thing to maintain in your marriage is romance. And, and, and it, it, promotes, it, it promotes great memories that, that you want to relive in your marriage. But I want you to know, when you form this union outside of marriage, it, it causes you to have impressions in your soul that you really don't want to relive, that are unhealthy, and they will be unhealthy for you if you ever marry. So it's very destructive to both your soul and if you ever marry, it's destructive to your marriage when it occurs outside of marriage. Being united to the Lord, though, man, if you are united to the Lord, as he says in this passage, you're one spirit with him. Being united to the Lord leaves an even more incredible impression on your soul. Well, if you commit sexual immorality, it creates an inner conflict in your soul between the impression that the Lord gives and the impression that you've had from your uh, immoral acts. In fact, what will happen if you practice sexual immorality, it's going to lead to all kinds of emotional and mental instability in your soul. You're going to be depressed. You're going to live with anxiety. You're going to live with uh, suicidal thoughts. You're going to be subject. People are taking all kinds of of medications today to try to resolve emotional and mental disorders and so much of the time in our immoral society it all began with sexual immorality and the confusion that it creates in the human soul I'm telling you God knew what he was talking about it will create shame as well and if you continue to fail What's going to happen to you if you claim to be a disciple of Jesus? You're going to begin to compensate for your shame by being religious. In other words, you're not going to really live out of a real spiritual relationship of walking with God. It's going to compensate for what I've done wrong, and you're going to be doing all of these good things, which have no life in them, by the way, in order to compensate for your failures. So sexual immorality subjects you to an unholy union. And then the sixth reason that he gives, sexual immorality subjects your body to potential problems as unlike any other sin. Look what he says in verse 18. Flee sexual immorality. 
And then he makes this statement. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Isn't that interesting? I mean, anything that's forbidden by the law of God is outside the body. If you look at the Ten Commandments. But he's saying when it comes to this sin... He is sinning against his own body. In other words, he's taking something in to his own body that's very destructive to his body and to his health. You know, from medical science, we know that sex is risky, right? I mean, what teenagers are being taught today is safe sex. Well, I want you to know there's no safe sex. The only safe sex I know of is get married and have it with one woman for life or one man for life. That's safe because that's the way God prescribed it. I mean, medical science knows how dangerous and risky this is. And uh, there is a, a transmission that happens through the one flesh encounter that can be very harmful to the human body. It's one of the reasons that there were so many laws in the Old Testament for the Jews about who they could marry and who they couldn't marry. I mean, there's an entire list in the Levitical law in chapter 18, verses 6 through 18. It was one of the reasons that virginity was so important to God and why some sexual sins were punishable by death in the Old Testament. Does that make any sense at all, that some sexual sins were punishable by death? It all came from the fact that God wanted a pure people, the Jews, and he understood what sexual immorality would do to them and their future descendants, not just what it would do to them uh, in their emotions, and their thoughts, but what it would do to them in their very uh, physical health. You know, science knows all about STDs. And, uh, you know, once young people today in public schools get into uh, high school and even before, they're being taught about sexually transmitted diseases. But this transmission of medical problems is not something that science, uh, medical science fully understands. If they did, they wouldn't be prescribing safe sex. They don't understand it. God understands it because God is the one who designed it. God is the one who made it. Paul understood that there are health problems that can be transferred to others and future descendants through sexual immorality, things that medical science doesn't even know about yet. You know, when we have a health problem, we want to know why did this happen? Well, what in the world caused this problem? Why did I get cancer? Why did I get this? You know, God gets a lot of blame for medical problems that were transferred to us from our own immorality or from some other rogue descendant in our past. I mean, this is a risky thing. This is a dangerous thing. You know, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And that's just not talking about uh, death itself. It's talking about the means of death in our lives. Besides murder, there's not a more destructive sin to your health and the health of your descendants than sexual immorality. I mean, who knows what I'm carrying around in me because of the, of the immorality of my previous descendants, and I want you to know they were immoral. Who knows what I've passed on to my children for that reason? Have you ever considered that before? You see what Paul is trying to do here? I mean, Paul is trying to build a wall. <laughs> You know, like I said, I wish he would have stopped with number one. No, he's trying to build a wall against this in the, in the uh, members of the church. And here's the seventh one and the last one that he gives. Sexual immorality subjects the temple of God to an unholy union. The temple of God to an unholy union. He says in verse 19, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You know, in the Old Covenant, the first hot spot for God's presence on earth was the Ark of the Covenant, which was kept in the inner sanctuary of what was called the Tabernacle of Moses. And that tabernacle for the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant was just a small box, okay, is all that it was. But that small box, by design, was where God met with the people of Israel. And he only met 
originally with Moses, and then he would meet with the high priest of Israel, and that box was in what was called the Holy of Holies, or the inner sanctuary of the temple. It was God's hot spot for manifesting his presence upon the earth, the Ark of the Covenant. Well, that, that tabernacle of Moses that Moses originally had, which was a temp, tent tabernacle, was a, a, a and it was eventually replaced by the tabernacle of David, which was also a tent tabernacle, by the way. And then that tabernacle was replaced by the tabernacle of Solomon in Jerusalem, which wasn't a tent tabernacle. It was a tabernacle that was constructed out of incredible stones. After the tabernacle of Sol uh, Solomon was destroyed by the Babylonians, do you know there's not any record of the Ark of the Covenant again in the Bible? We don't know what happened to it. That hot spot for God's presence was gone. And we don't even know what happened to the ark. Even after the tabernacle of Herod was built, there is not any record of the ark of the covenant being in that tabernacle. One of the reasons for that is that the prophets of the Old Testament predicted that the hot spot of God's presence on earth was going to be in men and women and not in a building or a tent. Jesus said to his followers, that if they believed in him, they would become the hot spot of God's presence. In other words, they were going to replace the Ark of the Covenant. And if you're in Jesus Christ, I want you to know, you have replaced the Ark of the Covenant. You are the temple, Paul said, of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you receive Jesus, you're bought with a price. And being bought with a price means you're no longer your own. You have become the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's who you are. Jesus sends his Holy Spirit to dwell in you to occupy what is rightfully his. You are the temple of his spirit. And as a result, if you've been bought with a price and you realize I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit, what should you do with your body? Well, you should do what we studied a few weeks ago in Romans 12, 1 and 2. You should present your body to God as a living sacrifice and say, God, here's your temple right here. You know, I'm the Ark of the Covenant. Here you go. I'm yours. I don't belong to myself. You bought me with a price. Your body is the temple of God's spirit. So you know what that means? That means if you or I commit sexual immorality, we are desecrating God's temple. That's what we're doing. Because we are the temple. We're desecrating it. You know, I could give you a lot of examples of desecration. Most of them that I would give you would gross you out. Well, we ought to be just as grossed out if we enter into sexual immorality about how we are desecrating the temple of God if we enter into sexual immorality. So Paul gives these seven reasons. And he says, flee, flee. <laughs> you know how you get it? Run away, you know? He has built his case. You should shun it. You should have nothing to do with sexual immorality. Sexual immorality subjects you to your old identity. It subjects you to the power of the law of sin. It subjects you to perverted appetites. It subjects the body of Jesus to an unholy union. It subjects you to an unholy union. Subjects your body to health problems. Subjects the temple of God to an unholy union. Case closed, right? Run from it. Distance yourself from it. Shun it. You know, no one loves you like God loves you. And God would not give us these kind of instructions right there within his word, except for the fact that he loves you. One of the ways that he's demonstrated his love for you is that he bought you with a price, a price that we really can't calculate, a price that we really can't comprehend. It's a price that no one else could pay for you because no one else is God. It's a price that no one would be willing to pay for you when you know what it is. God paid a price for you. And he gives you these instructions because he loves you and because he, he cares for us. The price that Jesus paid was, first, Jesus was the preexistent son of God from eternity past. He's always been and he will be. 
eternity future. He's the Alpha and the Omega. But yet, he, he willingly, as the Son of God, uh, a member of the Trinity, he volunteered to become a man, a human being like us, subject to our passions, subject to our desires, subject to persecution, subject to our environment. He emptied himself. That was the price that he paid. No one loves you like that. No one would do that for you. And then not only did he become a man for you, the Bible says he became sin for you. In other words, whatever acts of sexual immorality that you have committed in your life, when he was hanging on the cross, he became that sin for you. In other words, he became sexually immoral for you. He took on that sin when he was hanging on the cross for you. No one would do that for you but Jesus. No one would do that for you but God. Take on your, your sins. And then he became the object of God's wrath for you. And we can't measure the wrath of God. God is storing up his wrath every day. And one day he's going to come and judge the world. And all of his wrath is going to be poured out upon, upon sin. And everything that we see right now with our material eyes is going to be burned up with fire and consumed. The fire is going to be so hot that whatever exists will no longer exist. Now that's hot. That's the wrath of God when it comes to sin. While Jesus was hanging on that cross, Jesus experienced in himself that wrath for you. It was so intense that when Jesus was hanging there, he spoke and said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He felt the very wrath of God for you. No one here would do that. No one would do that for you but God. You see, no one loves you like God loves you. Oh, I, I love when I'm loved by other people, but I always know this, they don't love me like God loves me. And if they do love me, it's only because God has revealed his love to them. No one loves you like God loves you. Jesus paid this price for you, even though you were born a sinner. In other words, born in the law of sin, you were a slave to sin, and, and you have defied God. You've been a rebel against God. Jesus paid this price for you, even though you've been a rebel and an enemy of God, and he paid it for you anyway. Nobody loves you like that. No one extends love to you like that. He loves you even though you're a sinner. He loves you even though you're polluted by sin. Jesus paid this price for you even though there's nothing, nothing, let me say this, nothing, I can't emphasize it enough, about you that makes you appealing to a holy and righteous God. There's absolutely nothing about us that makes us appealing to him. And he loved you anyway because that's who he is. He is love. You know, uh, There's a lot of folks that have never been born again of the Spirit of God, and the simple reason is this. They really have never understood their own depravity before God. They still think that there's something about themselves that makes them a good person or makes them appealing to God, and they really don't, haven't ever seen how polluted their heart is with sin, how defiled they are, we tend to measure ourselves with other people and say, well, I've never done that, you know. You know, I've only been with two women in my life, my wife Debbie and my wife Sandra. Isn't that incredible? It is incredible. But I want you to understand something. My heart was so polluted by sin. My heart was filled with lust. Left to myself, I would have become, no telling what I would have become if it wasn't for Jesus. I'm not any better than you. You're not any better than me. We're all defiled before a holy and righteous God. We are depraved. And you know what? He says, I love you. I love you. I love you so much. I'm going to pay for your sin. I'm going to pay for your perversion. 
I, I am going to, I'm going to pay. And you know what? I love you so much that if you'll receive me, Jesus says, I'll make you a child of God. You know what I'll do? He said, I'll make you holy. I'll make you righteous. Yeah, initially, it'll be a gift of righteousness that you'll receive legally that'll make you acceptable. And then through the work of my spirit, I'm going to give birth to your spirit, and I'm going to clean up your mind. I'm going to clean up your emotions. I'm going to clean up your desires. Who loves you like that, church? It's only Jesus. Let me ask you, and I want you to be real honest this morning with yourself and with God. Has your heart ever been changed by the love of God? Have you seen your sinful condition before God and then seen the love of God for you and you were so astounded by the fact that he loved you in spite of your sinful condition and he wanted you that your heart was changed and became soft toward God and you loved him and you wanted to follow him? Has that ever happened to you this morning? I think for many in the church, the reason they continue to live sexually immoral lives is that has never happened. Their hearts have never been changed. Your heart's never been changed by the love of God. And you're playing some kind of game of religion that's basically religious compensation that leaves you empty and dry. That's not what God has for you. He wants you to receive his love in a way that it so changes your heart that you will want to live for him, that you will want to serve him, that you will want to leave behind the sins that you've committed in your past. So have you received Jesus? If you haven't, this morning we're going to have a time of prayer, and we want you to receive him. You know how you indicate that you are receiving Jesus as your personal Savior? You go up and you get baptized, just like our brother did this morning. You publicly say, you know what? I am putting my faith and trust in Jesus Christ for my salvation. And I'm going to demonstrate it in the way that Jesus said it should be demonstrated through water baptism. If you're willing to do that this morning, then come down and see me right here at the front during this prayer time. And we'll talk for a few minutes or I'll direct you to someone who will talk with you. But let me ask you this, church. Church at Western Hills, will you now flee sexual immorality? If you practice sexual immorality this last week, this last month, will you flee it now? Will you take the word of God? If you, if you really are born again of the spirit of God and a, and a true disciple of Jesus, will you go, you know what? I'm going to flee that. You know, look what God did. Look at the warnings God gave right here in this passage of scripture because he loves you. And he's calling you out of that. He's calling you to purity for him. Will you flee, church? Will the church in Oklahoma City flee? Oh, the church in Oklahoma City is, is being so polluted by the practice of sexual immorality. Will they flee? I want to encourage you, if this message has meant anything to you, share it with others. Share it with others in the body of Christ. Say, hey, we need to flee this. We need to walk in purity before the Lord. And we need to, we need to encourage one another to walk in purity before the Lord. Let's pray together. If you want to receive Jesus this morning, follow him in baptism. Just come to me right down here, and I'll be waiting to talk with you for a few moments, direct you to those who will help you with whatever you need help with. I know that some of you need to be saved this morning. They're here. I want to encourage you with all I've got within me to do that. For some of you, you genuinely experience the Lord, but you've fallen back into that trap of sexual immorality. Today, is to make, you need to make up your mind that you're going to flee. You're going to flee. You know, I know it can be costly. It could end a relationship if you flee. The person that you've been with may not agree with it. It could mean you need to be honest with some brothers in your small group about your life and the way you've been living your life. You've been walking in secret sin. 
and re- fleeing from this sin means you need to go to them and say, you know what, I need your encouragement. I've been failing. I've been failing. I've been looking at pornography. I've been, I've been fornicating. I, whatever it's been. And you need to be honest and transparent with some brothers in your group or sisters in your group. Say, you know what, I need your encouragement. I want you to surround me and help me walk out of this. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you, Lord, for you being so direct with us. Thank you that you just you just lay it out there through your apostles and your prophets. And you show us, Lord, what's best for us, how you want us to live, how you want us to honor your name, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for doing that. Thank you for your great grace and your mercy. It's available to all of us. Oh, if we'll repent of our sin and turn to you. Oh, Jesus, you're so merciful. stand together. If you have a need for prayer, I want to invite you to come. Come to my right or my left.